900 passenger superjet, the Lockheed Very Large Plane. A monstrous large double-decker mega transport airliner was Lockheed Martin's proposal 10 years before the Airbus A380 soared to the skies. This insane plane, which was designed in 1996, would have ruled the skies. It was bigger than an A747 and could carry more people than an A380. They would require assistance from both Airbus and Boeing to construct it since it was so large. Let's investigate this unbuilt aircraft. The 1990s saw a significant issue at airports. They were crammed. Large airplanes like the Boeing 747 and economy class tickets have made flying so popular that there was a shortage of available runway space. Airports that formerly provided landing and takeoff pairs for free to airlines that were now charging a premium for them, with some well-known airports like Heathrow and JFK asking millions. There were only so many hours in the day to land at these places, which prevented airlines from expanding. Therefore, larger planes were the answer. Airbus followed Boeing's lead in setting the trend with the A340 series, and there were rumors that numerous companies were working on something even larger. Boeing established the trend with the 747. To get a piece of the action, Lockheed Martin, which had departed the commercial aviation division following the development of the L-1011 Trijet, decided to consider a logical next step in aircraft design. This resulted in the development of a program named the Large Supersonic Transport, a collection of concepts from a plane that would be the Boeing 747's logical successor. This aircraft would address the issue of constrained airport capacity, meeting growing demand in nations like China, and serve as the U.S. Air Force's next military aircraft as its fleets of transport aircraft neared retirement. They developed reports that would meet each of these needs by collaborating with NASA. For this endeavor, Lockheed would require all the help they could get, including enlisting the help of Boeing and Airbus. The future of very large supersonic transports was a terrific title for the paper, and the aircraft ideas inside were even better. The group presented numerous ideas for the then future of aviation, including two straightforward designs with low wings, a big span loader, and collaborating with Donna to build a massive seaplane. The final design was the most developed, with two integrated tail engines and a merged wing body. The Lockheed, a very large supersonic airplane, was its catchy moniker, and it was a massive aircraft. It was similar to the Boeing 777X of today in that it featured four powerful engines, a takeoff weight of 1.4 million pounds, and a wingspan of 282 feet with folding wingtips that reduced it to 211 feet, the same as the Boeing 747. It was one of the longest planes in existence at a stunning 262 feet in length, which was another enormous aspect of it. This aircraft would have dominated airports all over the world and necessitated significant changes to the gates and runways, much like the A380 did 10 years later. Let's discuss what it could have been like to ride on board. With 450 people per deck and a three-class cabin layout, this enormous aircraft could have accommodated about 900 passengers. The width of this aircraft was also astounding. Therefore, travelers may have found themselves in a cabin that was either 34343 with four aisles or 17 seats wide. It is undoubtedly wide considering the airplane can only fit 10 passengers today. Studies have also been done on modular passenger sections that could be changed out between flights and added amenities like spas, dining options, or even casinos for when an aircraft was flying over international waters. A cargo variant of this aircraft with intermodal containers was also available by Lockheed Martin. Yes, supersonic aircraft can carry the same containers as are used on railroads, boats, and trucks. The aircraft would have been ideal for island destinations like the Caribbean because it could have accommodated 16 of these containers on the lower deck while still carrying 450 passengers on the upper deck. The plane's maximum range was only 3,200 nautical miles, or about 5,900 kilometers according to the design documents. When compared to the Boeing 747, which had a range of 7,700 nautical miles, this is alarmingly little. Alternatively, the Airbus A380, which can travel 8,000 nautical miles today. With a distance of 3,008 nautical miles, the most popular destination route at the time was between London and New York. Therefore, this jet would have been able to do it. However, any routes that crossed the Pacific would have had to fall in either Alaska or Hawaii. And because it couldn't travel far enough, this would have made it unpopular with Asian airlines or people in the Middle East. And trust me, they needed every airline they could get on board, 
especially when you consider their anticipated sales figures. Lockheed Martin, you see, was upbeat and thought that it would be a mark for between 280 to 370 aircraft. In contrast, just 242 Airbus A380s were sold, which is 38 fewer than the minimum quantity Lockheed Martin had expected to sell. However, this was the decade of montages and Olympic victories for peewee hockey teams in the early 1990s. Naturally, they had hope. They estimated an optimistic price range for this aircraft of between $200 and $300 million, or roughly $500 million in today's currency. When you consider that Lockheed intended to sell airlines multiple of these planes and that at the time airlines generated less profits annually, it becomes even more pessimistic. Why was it never created despite the team having a market understanding and strong concept under their belts? Lockheed Martin confessed at the end of the study that it lacked the resources and expertise to construct this jet for the first time because an aerospace company had displayed hubris. They said they would need to collaborate with Boeing and Airbus at the same time. It cost 18 billion US dollars to create this Airbus from conception to sale. Because Airbus and Boeing originally collaborated on the A380 before Airbus was independent, this isn't too far-fetched. But the Super Lockheed plane program had more than one floor. The design also had several other drawbacks. The extremely loud takeoff and landing would be the first. The size of the plane with its four engines would be like a rocket taking off even with current engines. Additionally, this device would consume a lot of fuel, making operations extremely expensive. To undertake turnaround operations for the aircraft, all new gates would need to be constructed in new service vehicles. All those modular containers would take a long time to load and even longer to unload. In an emergency, if it crashed into the sea, its weight would cause most runways to collapse under its weight and it would sink nearly instantly. Speaking of emergencies, it was clear that evacuating the passengers would be challenging. The FAA evacuation guide would most likely not be followed if you were sitting in one of the center seats because you were relatively far from the closest exit. And how high up would the slides have to be for people to exit? And trust me, I'm not done with emergencies. It would be on par with those at a water park. The what-if scenarios must also be examined in the study. If two of these aircraft collide on the runway while carrying a combined 2,000 passengers, the size of the object would also produce a sizable air vortex, which could delay aircraft landing or takeoff behind it. This would decrease the available airport slot and completely defeat the object's original purpose for congested airports. Why then did it even need to be built? Lockheed Martin needed a great deal more study, research, and wind tunnel tests because the design was so dissimilar from a standard aircraft and they were unsure how it would handle normal aircraft's day-to-day -day flight operations. All of this proved to be too much for the business, which had only recently left the commercial aviation industry and the project was abandoned. 